So Triumph have made some huge improvements on this generation of Tiger 1200. There's more power, less weight, more tech, and this more aggressive sort of styling package. And having spent plenty of time riding it, you know, it really has taken the range up to another level. And it's really right up there with the best of the large capacity adventure bikes. But is it enough to beat the absolute GOAT in the adventure bike segment, the BMW R1250 GS? Not only is this the best selling large capacity adventure adventure bike in the UK by a massive margin, but it's the best selling large capacity motorcycle by a huge stretch. All for good reason, of course it's a brilliant bike and so I'm at Superbike Factory today to do a bit of proper back to back riding with these two bikes. So in this video we'll go through the key points of difference, I'll give them each a score and then at the end we'll declare a winner. Now look, there are so many various models in these two lineups and so many different levels of spec and packages and different optional accessories. And so it really is hard to do a like proper like for like comparison. So today I'm going to focus on what I think are the big key differences that affect pretty much all the bikes in each of the lineups. One of the things that really does set them apart is the character of those two engines. Firstly with the BMW we've got their famous boxer twin and this is the most recent 1250 version which gets their shift cam tech so it emphasizes mid-range and torque and efficiency in the lower revs but as the revs climb it switches over to a different cam and that gives you more free-flowing top-end power. Proper clever stuff but really it's the fundamentals of that engine that makes Make it so good so number one the fact that it's got nice even firing intervals so that gives it a very smooth feel it's perfect for doing big miles secondly the way that it's laid out means the weight is held nice and low which has a positive effect on handling and then thirdly being a twin cylinder it's got plenty of torque and mid-range which makes it super usable out on the road now the triumph also gets a unique engine layout for the large capacity adventure bike market and that's its 1200 triple with a t-plane crown Thank Previous generations of Triumph Triple had even firing intervals, a little bit like the BMW actually, but it was 120 degrees on the crank between each cylinder. And again, like the BMW, the result of that is you get a nice, silky, smooth ride, which makes it really good for long distance touring. But the thing is, with it being a triple cylinder instead of a twin, they found that some customers felt that it was lacking a little bit of torquiness and bottom end grunt, especially when you set it against stuff like the V-Twin in the KTM, the Parallel Twin in the Africa Twin, and then of course this GS and so what they've done is played with the spacing of those three cylinders to make two of them closer together and then you've got larger intervals either side of that third cylinder firing so two close together one further apart makes it feel a little more like a twin. Now personally having spent plenty of time on the Tiger 900 which was the first bike to get the T-plane crank and then subsequently plenty of time with this bike I think it's had the desired effect. This certainly feels much more torquey and grunty in the low revs than the previous generation bike. It also gives it a brilliant sound. Of course, there's nothing else that sounds like it. I think the closest thing you'll get is maybe like a V4, something like the Multistrada V4. But yeah, under acceleration, I think it just sounds fantastic. And of course, while they've done all this work, they've added quite a lot more peak power. In fact, it makes a good chunk more peak power than the GS. The only downside with that T-plane crank is that it does introduce some more vibrations, especially when you're cruising at motorway speeds a little bit above 70, let's say. It's not as smooth as the previous gen. It's not as smooth as the GS, but I think if you're looking for a bit more excitement and you're looking for a nice almost v 20 delivery then the trade-off is probably worth it but as for which of these bikes has the better engine it's too close to call for me this makes more torque and it's more silky smooth the tiger on the other hand well it has this visceral exhaust note that i think is more exciting and it does make more peak power and so I think I'll have to call this one a draw. Now onto the handling, and I think the thing that defines how the GS handles is this telelever front end. So whereas a typical bike would have the springs inside the fork legs, this actually gets a wishbone type thing that acts like a swing arm. And then you've got sort of dummy forks that just slide up and down and suspension duties are actually taken care of by a monoshock. Now part of the benefit is the ride, which we'll get onto in a moment, but also it does give it this nice anti-dive feeling. It really really doesn't duck much at the front end 
even under quite heavy braking. As we were saying though with the trade-off with the T-plane crank on this bike, you know, the telelever front end also has its own trade-offs, chiefly that it doesn't really give you all that much feedback at the front end. And in a way that kind of makes it feel quite precise, wherever you turn the bars it sort of goes and it doesn't really like I say, feedback that much, it doesn't resist. And so it does feel like it'll just go where you point it. But if you wanna feel more from the road surface beneath you and get more feedback on what's happening with the front wheel, then a traditional fork setup is probably gonna feel better. So the Tiger gets a much more familiar setup with a pair of regular upside down forks, although they do get some pretty impressive internals, courtesy of Showa. It's pretty much the latest and greatest from their semi-active electronically adjustable system. And it's all tied into the riding mode so things like the damping will firm up if you put it into sport mode. There's even things like jump detection so if it knows that the bike is in mid-air it'll immediately firm things up in the blink of an eye so that when the bike lands it tries to avoid bottoming out. Now the BMW also gets their dynamic ESA system so that's also electronically adjustable and you can do a lot of the same stuff so things like setting the preload through the switch gear and dash but I guess the important thing about this bike having it is that it negates some of the benefit of the other bikes telelever because this does anti-dive as well it knows when you're on the brakes and so it knows to firm the fork up at the same time it handles a little more like a regular bike you do get a bit more feedback from the front and so i think this is the slightly better handling bike plus the braking system for me is just that bit more crisp at the lever and feels like it has more power and that makes sense because these are top-notch Brembo style lemmas and you also get a radial master cylinder. Now of course you want a big adventure bike like this that's built for doing decent touring miles to be super comfortable and fortunately both bikes deliver on that front. Now that telelever front end which is unique in this market segment you know it does have its benefits certainly in this department because the ride quality is sublime. Working in tandem with that dynamic ESA, I don't think there are many bikes that just have this like super cushy gliding feel even over rough road surfaces and yet at the same time it maintains its composure, it doesn't dive and wallow around. Plus you've got a nice big cushy seat, really good ergonomics with this wide commanding bar position and also the wind protection is pretty comprehensive so good hand guards, a good windscreen, plenty of width in the tank that also helps and you've got the engine sticking out at either side and so even on the longest days I've ever done on the GS I've always felt like I could easily do more. Now look the Tiger 1200 equals it in almost every regard. The wind protection is brilliant, it's actually got a easier to use adjustable wind screen. The cushiness and comfort of the seat is super similar to this bike as are the ergonomics. It's a big bike, plenty of space but the one shortcoming on those longer rides as I've said is the vibrations that you get with the T-plane. I've still done decent long days out on that bike and it's not been a terrible problem but I think if it really came down to it and I was doing like a week of touring with some really serious mileage then almost certainly I'd go for the GS just for that smoothness. The other thing that you're going to get with these big modern adventure bikes is absolutely bags of tech and features and both of these bikes are super well appointed. In fact they match each other pretty much like for like in most departments. We've already talked about the electronic suspension. Both bikes tie that into a whole bunch of riding modes and each of those riding modes has a bunch of settings for a variety of lean sensitive rider aids. You also get a variety of engine maps. They both get cruise control, a TFT display to manage all this stuff and they're pretty similar. I'd say the Triumph perhaps looks a little bit more crisp and punchy. They both get keyless ignition that includes the steering lock and the fuel filler cap and while there are a couple of like little superficial features on the most recent version of the GS like the welcome and goodbye headlight animation thing, I think the Tiger edges this one for two key features. Number one is backlit switch gear. I still don't know why you don't get this on the GS and even though I expect that some of those buttons are going to become muscle memory if you own a bike for a good amount of time it's still just like come on i'm paying a lot of money for a bike can you not just put backlit switch gear on it. Secondly, on these more touring focused Explorer models, so you've got the Rally Explorer, the GT Explorer, they get a 30 litre fuel tank, so they're equivalent to the GS Adventure. You actually get a rear facing radar that gives you blind spot warning. So if there's something sitting just off to one side of you and you can't see it in your mirrors, it's gonna illuminate this little LED on the bottom of the wing mirror there. And it's just a nice safety net that I think most of us can agree you'd rather have than not. Now, 
BMW do have radar tech in the form of active cruise control on their R1250RT and also the R18, so I wouldn't be surprised if it's out on the GS pretty soon. But in the current market, you know there's no radar tech available on that bike, and so the tech has to go to the Tiger. Now, whether you like it or not, the styling is gonna form part of a lot of people's buying decision. And so I always like to stick this category in, but this one I think is a little too close to call. Perhaps the Triumph is looking a little more chiseled and aggressive, but you know, this is a beautiful looking bike as well. It's pretty much a question of taste. So as always, I'd love to know which one you think looks best down in the comments. Now, in terms of price, you really have to compare these bikes feature for feature, because if you just look at the RRPs for the main five models in this lineup and however models are in this lineup, it's not really gonna reveal that much. You really have to get into the configurator for the GS to spec it up exactly the same as a bike like this. And I actually found that when I've done that, the price difference isn't quite as much as I expected. Pretty much the point of the Rally Explorer is to throw the entire accessories catalog at it. And there's really not much left in there apart from luggage. So specking the GS Adventure with almost every option in the catalog brings it just about on a par and I think there's only a few hundred quid in it. Now I don't think that's going to be a massive deciding factor if you're already spending close to 20 grand on a bike. The one feature you can't spec on it is that rear facing radar with the blind spot warnings but like I say they're so close that I don't really think it's fair to award a point. Anyway, let's tally up the scores. So a draw on the engine, the handling went to the Tiger, comfort to the BMW, tech to the Tiger, and then the rest were even. That makes it a 2-1 to the Tiger in this test, and I think that's probably a fair reflection of where my buying decision would go. If I was doing loads and loads of big touring miles, I think the smoothness of the GS would edge it for me, but it's not really something I do because I've got young kids. We don't go away on holidays on the bike. And so the extra little bits of tech and the more exciting engine would probably sway me towards the Tiger, but it's a close run thing. A massive thanks for watching today. I hope you enjoyed the video. And once again, a massive thanks to Superbike Factory for supporting the channel. Let me know which bike you pick down in the comments below and if you're new here and you want to see more videos like this hit subscribe and i'll catch you in the next one